Let's describe some of the mechanical properties that are specific to ceramics, right? So what do we know about ceramics? They're really brittle, right? That right off the bat, that's going to change some of the ways that we can test and think about their properties. For example, with a metal and a polymer, when you're testing them, you could take your Instron, which has basically like some glorified vice grips like this. It can clamp onto your sample and you can pull it to stretch it and test it. How do you think that's going to work if I take these big old vice grips and I clamp onto a dinner plate, right? If I really clamp onto there to make a good connection, I'm just going to break the plate right at the contact points, right? Because we know that they're brittle and the strain that you need to plastically deform and to bite onto it, that's just going to cause it to fracture, right? That's because ceramics tolerate basically no strain at all. Very, very little strain, okay? Therefore, we can't use the typical dog bone type samples when we're testing ceramics for a couple reasons. First off, they'd be way too hard to machine. Machining a, a ceramic into that shape might be more money and effort than it's worth. And you'd break it, and it fails at really small strains anyways. Because of that, we'll often test ceramics under compression. We'll squeeze them instead, right? Or we'll do bend testing. Three or four point bending is very commonly used. So how does that work? Well, this would be your sample. It's sort of a matchstick shaped sample. And instead of pulling on it, we're going to bend it. If we bend it, you can imagine, like you can see here, if I'm bending it like this, the top portion of the ceramic would be under tension. The bottom portion by my thumbs would be under compression, right? So that's this would be an example of four point bending, right? Because I've got one, two, three, four points. If I did this, that would be three point bending, right? You see the three points where I'm loading it at over here, okay? So three or four point bending is another great option because uh, you don't need to clamp onto it anywhere. You're just bending it, right? And you can still get some measure of the yield strength, right? It's not the yield strength. What you're measuring is the modulus of rupture, and it has a specific formula, three times the load applied, divided by the separation, uh, multiplied by the separation between those points, divided by two times b h squared, where b and h are dimensions of your sample, right, width and height, okay? So the question is this, should you get the same result if you do three point or four point bending? So you've got the exact same sample, right? In one case, you're going to load it three-point bending, meaning these are your forces. In another scenario, you're going to do this, four-point bending. What's the difference? Should you get the same exact response? No, you will not get the same response, and here's why. If you've taken statics yet, then you've learned about bending moments in materials, and you know that three-point versus four-point bending have different bending moments. They both might reach the exact same magnitude of bending moment, like the height of these are the same, but in three-point bending, that occurs at a single plane in your material. But in four-point bending, it occurs over this entire volume. This entire volume gets exposed to your maximum bending moment, right? And so if bending moment is what's going to cause rupture, you can think of it as a proxy for stress, then a larger volume of your sample, in this case, all the way from here to here gets exposed to your largest stress. Whereas in three-point bending, it only occurs at one tiny little point right there in the center. Therefore, statistically speaking, your odds of having a critical flaw, right? If you've got a flaw in your material right there, it might fracture. But that flaw would have had to been right in the dead center for three-point bending to give you the same yield strength. Therefore, when you do three-point bending, you get higher strength values, but it's artificial, it's not real. In four-point bending, you're testing more of your sample, so the strength goes down, but it's more representative of real life because your flaws are all over the place, not just at one plane in your material, okay? What else can we say about ceramics? Ceramics, almost always, we start with them as particles, right? A bunch of loose particles, and then we do something to pack these together, right? So you get them arranged uh, packed together in not necessarily like an FCC or HCC packing, but you pack them as closely as you can. And then what you do is you heat these up and you cause them to center together. So you can see in here I've got all these void spaces. See all these empty spaces in between? The process of centering gets rid of those by causing these things to come together. And you can see it. Here's a, an, an instance where they did it in a, a bubble raft, right? So again, uh, this allows you to use bubbles as proxies for atoms, but here's a bunch of different grains, right, particles. They brought them, they removed the things kept separating them, and they sort of came together, and you can see that these regions in the middle, these grain boundaries form, 
but the porosity has largely been gotten rid of, right? There's a little, see, there you go. You lost that final bit of porosity. So it started out, it had pores, but in the sintering process, in order to reduce surface area, these things come together, right? Here you see it again. See those pores disappearing? That's what happens when you sinter ceramics is you get rid of these pores as they come together, right? So uh, obviously it's hard to get rid of all those pores. You have to do a lot of, you can squeeze on it while you heat it. You can heat it to really high temperatures, but still you might be left with some amount of porosity, 1%, 5%, 10%, more. Um, what's that going to do to your mechanical properties? What do you think? Well, let's think about elastic modulus and flexural strength. The elastic modulus goes down. Here's an example, right? Here they're showing the modulus of rupture as a function of how much porosity is left over, right? So as you move to more and more porosity, you see the modulus of rupture going down. And then here you have elastic modulus. And again, it's more of a linear relationship as you increase the volume fraction of pores. So adding these things will uh, make them more compliant, weaker materials if you have more pores left over in them. Why? Um, the strength reduction comes because one, the cross-sectional area is effectively reduced. If I were to chop open my, my material and it's got these pores left over in it, right? Then the material that's able to bear the load is this cross-hatched material. The pores can't bear any load. And so it's, it's like, you know, even though I thought that I had some length here and some length here, so I had some area, the area actually gets reduced. It's actually become smaller when you account for the porosity that's within your material, right? And then the other reason why it reduces strength is that these act as stress concentrators. We just spent a whole chapter learning about brittle fracture, right? Fracture and brittle materials. And we said that flaws act as stress concentrators and they reduce our overall um, performance.